Good morning and welcome to Many Paths, Many Visions, brought to you by the Labyrinth Society and with your host, Christiana Brinton. Today I'm speaking with Oregon native, garden designer, and stone artist Jeffrey Bale, who is a featured speaker at the Labyrinth Society's gathering this year on Bainbridge Island, Washington. Greetings, Jeffrey. Welcome to Many Paths, Many Visions. Thank you for joining me today. Hello. How are you doing, Christiana? I am doing great. I'm doing great. And yourself? How are you doing? Uh, wonderful. Yeah, it's a cool autumn day, a little rain here, and um, yeah, it's beautiful. So. Right. So let's dive right in. We had a little bit of a, we had to get our sound stuff uh, organized here. So it, we're a little bit late getting to get, getting this going. So I'm going to dive right in. So this year's gathering theme is honoring the labyrinth environment, co-creating with nature. And you've been living, breathing, and working within the seam, if not directly with labyrinth designs, at least with uh, mandalic type of stone forms for over 30 years. So t tell us a little bit, did this fascination with natural stone develop because you were born and raised in the Pacific Northwest and there's lots of rivers and estuaries and bays and stone everywhere? In yes, this exactly. Area? Yeah. yeah, there's stone everywhere. And my family are avid fishermen, so we would go fishing. Most of our camping trips would be out along rivers and lakes, and I could only fish for so long, you know. So I would start stacking rocks and building things along the shore. And um, But also my grandparents, uh, my paternal grandparents were rock hounds, so they were actually geologists who went out and um, collected stone and cut them and made um, made belt buckles and um, cabochons for cowboys, bolo ties and things, because it's Oregon. So um, so they had this business where they would cut stones and they had a garden filled with minerals and knew a great deal about geology and actually worked with the Oregon State University Geology Department as a consultant. And so I learned a lot as a child about stone just from going to their house. And So this and is we, the mother's side of the family or the father's? On my father's side, yeah. So, but my mother, my mother's side of the family, he also they lived in Central Oregon, which there are all these rock shops, and yes. so we would go out there and go to shops where they sell all these different minerals and things, and um, and uh, they built a big rock fireplace in their backyard out of lava rock and specimen rock. So I had this. Um, these childhood kind of fantasy places. We would go to a place called Peterson's Rock Garden, which is one of those eccentric um, visionary environments. It's in central Oregon. And this man spent his entire adult life building little miniature houses and bridges and um, villages and with using collected stone, beautiful stone. So I've actually written a blog about that garden and uh, revisited some of the um, early influences I've had. Oh my golly, that's a, this is a whole interview and in, into it of itself that I would love yeah, to explore. Yeah, <laughs> so, but anyway, so I when I I got a degree in landscape architecture and started to build, um, I started a design build business and I went to Europe and saw mosaic work and I had been collecting stone for several years and with no purpose as to what I was going to do with it and taught myself how to build mosaics. Okay. So wait, so let's let's go back a little bit. So so it's in your genes for sure for sure, not to mention where you lived and the environment that you lived in. So but for those of us who aren't trained geologists, um, first of all, can you just describe the three kinds of stone found on earth and which ones are found throughout Oregon and Washington? Well, the first one would be igneous, which would be volcanic stone. So coming out of volcanic, um, you know, it's it's magma that's, um, I mean, basically the earth has a crust, you know, on the surface, but then a molten interior and then an iron core. And so um, the Cascades is a chain of volcanoes and Oregon's biggest mountains are all volcanoes. So, so the pre predominant stone in the Cascades is igneous. Then there's sedimentary rock, so that would be um, deposits on seafloors, so sandstone and 
limestone, things like that are sedimentary rocks. So the Grand Canyon has a lot of sedimentary, um, you know, when you're in Arizona, um, on the coast of the Oregon coast, you'll see sedimentary formations and lake bed formations. And then the third one is metamorphic. So that can be either igneous or sedimentary rock that have been changed with intense pressure and heat inside the earth, you know, below the surface. And so it's basically kind of crushing the rock under massive amounts of pressure and heat and it changes the crystal and structure of it. And so metamorphic rock is usually the, has the most variety and colors and interesting um, kind of compositions. And so those, there are specific regions where you'll find metamorphic uh, formations. A lot of Puget Sound, like where Bainbridge Island is, is glaciated rock that was dragged from, during the Ice Age, there was over a mile of ice on top of Bainbridge Island in Puget Sound. So, so most of the material that's there was dragged down from Canada and other, you know, formations and by the glaciers scraped out of the sides of mountains and then deposited as the glaciers receded. Um, Southern Oregon has the Siskiyous has a lot of uh, metamorphic rock schist and serpentine and you get beautiful swirling patterns and crystal quartz crystals and things in those in those kinds of formations. Okay, so when you see quartz crystals, that's metamorphic rock. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. That's yeah, they would be they would be fractures that formed and then crystal and um, this kind of crystal and formation would fill those cracks. So that's why you get white veins and things. But sometimes, like in New Zealand where I'm working, there are huge quartz veins. So we have boulders that weigh two tons that are solid white quartz. And, oh my golly! Wow. Yeah, some very spectacular minerals. Hmm. Wow. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I took a course in geology in when I went back to college, and it was uh, I just loved it. But I don't remember that whole part. So that was great. Great for you to fill us in. So basically, in Oregon and Washington, you can find all of them depending on where you are. Yeah, but mostly in the region that I live in, most of it is is volcanic so it's it tends to be kind of gray or brown sometimes red lava rock but the colors aren't particularly exciting um so i don't so i tend to travel a lot to get my stone there are stones that were brought down from montana from these massive ice age floods the columbia river gorge was formed by they think up to a hundred of these catastrophic floods came down across central Washington. And so they brought, so there's a lot of gold quartz and things you'll find on certain beaches. So um, I, so I basically I'm scouting all the time. Anywhere I go, I'm always pulling over if there's a beach or crossing a bridge and I go down and see what's there. And if you understand geology, you can kind of, you know, realize what the types of stone are and um, figure out where they came from, find formations that, deposited certain kinds of materials and and then it tells you the story of basically how it's kind of like the creation story essentially of how a region was formed and wonderful the, fascinating the story. so so that's a very important thing to me and it gives you a kind of a vernacular for where to start and what to that story I, I tend to try to incorporate that into the work that i'm doing using the stone so that it honors the stone and teaches you something about where it came from so this is so so i was going to say so you know when you most landscape designers you know stone is used all the time wall right. paths terraces sometimes they'll incorporate pattern using different color pieces but you create pictures in the stone with the stones that tell a story yeah. So is this what you're talking about, this self-expression, this form of self-expression is telling, uh, so talk about this, this telling a story aspect, because to me, what you're saying here is multi-layered. You're talking about the st natural story, the story of creation, the story of how a, a region evolved, as well as you've got a client, right, who wants a story told or right. Or, right. Exactly. So um, originally when I first, like I went to Spain and Portugal and they do more pictorial, like patterned mosaics where you're using stones that have been sorted by size and shape and then doing uh, repeated patterns, making lines and um, designs that are basically pictorial. So it's not so much about 
the stone itself as a geologic object is more of a component in a larger picture. And so, so I've built a lot of mosaics where I would not have, I mean, the clients would have a budget. And so I wouldn't be able to like, I'm going to drive to Puget Sound, you know, and charge you for, you know, 15 hours of driving while I go out and collect. So I would wind up going just to a stone yard and buying a couple of yards of a drain rock or something, and then sorting through that and sorting out shapes and colors. And then I could make a pattern that looked like a Persian carpet or, um, some kind of pictorial design but then my favorite work was always stone that I gathered from the wild and all the work I did at my home was wild gathered stone so it has more character each stone has individual character and I tend to do more naturalistic designs so so I'm alluding to natural patterns and forms rather than pictorial kind of human generated uh, imagery Does that okay. makes sense yes <laughs> Yes. And, and so for instance, I will, I will, I'm giving you something from my background. I lived for a while on Lindos roads and there they, uh, the little ladies, the yayas come in and put good luck, uh, iconic, uh, stone forms in the mandalic patterns in every house that gets renovated there. And it's a, there's mm. an art board and you can't build, rebuild a house there without them coming in and doing this. And the, the pictures are iconic to, uh, an island, Greek island, which is, it would be an octopus or a dolphin or right, a starfish. Right. Yeah. And, and they come in and they do their, and the egg, the stones are egg shaped and they're on end. And so this is, and so this is a good luck thing. So you cross over the threshold. This is guarding the air, the guarding the family, guarding the, the site and providing good luck. So. Yeah. And, and then as opposed to the picture that I saw of that wonderful piece that you did of the flow of water, the what the ocean looks like with the right. different uh -huh. colored stones. That's what you're talking about. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. So that's so I'm doing an, an basically I'm an abstraction of natural forces of nature and patterns. Um but I also incorporate a lot of mythology. Um like the labyrinth on Bainbridge Island, there's a lot of Greek mythology incorporated into it because I I went to Greece while I was working on the project and brought back a bunch of stones from sacred places where um nine of the circuits are related to the nine planets. So so I got in I'm very interested in the concept of the Big Bang and these celestial explosions that create all these different elements basically are formed from all the, um, you know, kind of molecular and chemical structure of things becomes uh becomes all the all the materials that are like the earth is made out of but every star in the universe you know we have uh, there's stardust in everything and within our bodies and so i'm interested in that connection so i've been doing a lot of more celestial related designs but um but that that ties into mythology so um mm -hmm. our, our planets are named after um the Roman names of Greek gods. Right, right, yeah, right. Well, the yeah, the cal the astrological calendar, right, exactly. Yeah, right, exactly. So, and the center of the labyrinth is the sun, and so I did these kind of abstracted representations relating to the to the Greek god that the planet was named after, and the aspect of of that god. Say, Uranus is the god of the sky, and so I did el um, air element. I've made little mosaics of birds, swallows. Um, in that circuit um the neptune circuit has starfish in it um because I, and i would also see these things because i collected all the rock from beaches on the island um, okay the so let's talk about that wait a minute let's talk about the process that you use so you have about collecting the rocks themselves you have guidelines for the gathering of your stones in your blog um jeffreygardens.blogspot.com you write um, it is imperative to me that I leave no discernible impact on the landscape when I collect stones. Talk about this a little bit. Why is this so important? 
Um, uh, partly because people express concern a lot of times, like you're taking rocks from the wild, you know, and then it's like, well, and I'm not doing it in a, a, you know, in an extractive way. I'm doing it as selective. I'm looking for specific shapes. So the stones need to be kind of block shaped. So they have a flattish top and, and fairly straight sides, preferably perpendicular, so that when you put them together, they fit tightly together. So they're like little building blocks, essentially, and they look like pebbles, but when if you really look at them, they have fairly flat, planar surfaces. And so um, Puget Sound is an inland sea, and so it has gentle wave action, so the stones tend to not be worn to round shapes. They tend to be a little more blocky, um, have angular shapes. that So it smooths the edges and the, and the corners of the stones, but it hasn't made them round by a constant wave action that you'll see on like on on the pacific ocean or something where you have big waves that are rolling the stones in the sand over and over and over again um, so i'm actually using these kind of architectural shapes and fitting them very tightly together i don't like to see the mortar hmm. so i'm I've learned um, one of the things what working when I was a kid collecting these stones from beaches is there's a period in your the development of your brain where you develop um, spatial recognition. And so I seem to have a gift for spatial recognition. When I'm at the beach, I'm scanning the rocks. I mean, I can't walk on a beach without just looking at the material. And I will recognize like, wow, that's a beautiful stone that has the perfect shape for making a mosaic. You know? But there may be one out of 100 or 200 or 300. And so I'm doing a very specific selection. I'm not going in filling up buckets and stripping a section. I'm just plucking specific stones that are scattered out over large area so you would never be able I could people live on in houses on this beach and they'd come out and go oh, you're taking a lot of stones but then I'd say you know if you can tell me where they came from you know identify oh there's stones missing from over here then then I will be more then I need to be more sensitive if you can recognize it so that I've actually been here mm -hmm. and they'd be like well no actually we can't tell and every time the tide comes in it completely changes you know moves with all the rocks around and deposits new rocks and so it's not there's no discernible if i see a sea um, anemone a little sea anemone living on the rock i will put it back you know so i don't i don't affect any life forms and i i, t I just try to be very sensitive and conscious when i collect yeah you're not going with a bucket loader and dig and Right, away. right. And when, <laughs> and when you buy stone from a stone yard it's usually quarried so if you're buying pebbles from a stone yard they they go down to a riverbed with big backhoes and yeah. scrape it out and basically kind of violate and even destroy the ecosystem. You know, gravel is mined and so they dig gigantic pits and yeah. basically, you know, and quarries, they blast out hillsides and remove all the trees. And so I don't like to buy stone for that reason, you know, unless it's absolutely necessary because it has had a dramatic um, negative impact on the on the environment but you did say that if your clients you know your clients ask you to do they have parameters they want you to do something for them uh, so you 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 ha your stone choices are informed by those parameters those that rec the client what the client is looking right, for exactly. Yeah, and it depends on where you're working, and so. Um, but I, but I, um, I raise that issue as part of the consciousness of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, because for me, ideally, if you do it, the more consciousness you put into it, the better karma it has, the better sense of peace that it has, the more intention. I think that it has more spiritual resonance, um, more power. Um, it's more shamanistic. So, so I like to work on that level because I think there's valid. Um, I've experienced valid um, reactions from nature. And I mean, think, uh, if you want something to be magical, you have to take it to a high level of, of you know, and the, the collection of the material is essential to that. You can't go out and, you know, strip mine something and then build something that's supposed to be sacred and expect it to have the blessings of the universe, you know, bestowed mm -hmm. upon it. So um, mm -hmm. it, it, there's, um, it's, that can be superstitious or something, but I really think that there's, the consciousness is, pays off. So, so yeah. getting back to what you were saying about 
being able, having that sixth sense, or to me, it's almost like a muscle memory. You've, you've grown up. Uh, you know, it's it's. I don't know. There's a there's music called uh, mus- a movie called uh, Smilla's Sense of Snow. I think it was called, and it was about this woman who lived in Finland or something, and always or and knew knew the diff- what snow looked like when it was hard, when it was soft, just by looking at it. So you have the same thing with stones. So this is a almost a muscle memory, something that you've 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 trained yourself for so long that the stones. This you respond to the stones in a very dis, you have distinctions around stone that most people don't have. Um, yeah, I mean, when people go to the beach with me, they'll say, "Can I help?" They'll want to help me collect stones, and they're always picking them up and going, "What about this one?" And I go, "Well, look at it." You know, I mean, a lot of times it'll be like, "Well, you know, they they've never actually really looked at a stone." It's yeah. um, when we learn language, you you know, tree, plant, flower. I mean, a lot of times people that's like their entire you know, knowledgeable experience with, with the plant kingdom or nature is, well, I learned that, you know, and you say, well, what's the difference between that tree and that tree? And they'll go, you know, I've never actually thought about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's amazing to me. And that's the same thing with rocks. They'll be like, well, they'll, they'll be picking them up and going, look at this one. Wow. Look at this one. And it's like, you've never actually walked on the beach and looked deeply at the stones and thought about them before they were just all stones but then when you start to consciously recognize that they're all different and they have different shapes and colors and and textures and the way they feel um it's a kind of a revelatory thing and and um but i've been teaching at this um, elementary school in the village where i'm working in new zealand and the kids the one of the teachers talked to me about they said, well, I said that certain kids in the class, because it's a one-room school, and uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, and certain kids just seem to attach to what I was talking about and teaching. And she said, well, those there's a certain age period where spatial recognition is really developing and, and that there's an awareness. It's like learning language when you're really young. It's much easier to learn other multiple languages when you're young than when you're older because your brain is actually developing that part of of how it functions. So spatial recognition is a really good thing to teach children between 8 and 14, something like that. So... Mm-hmm. So it'd be the perfect time to take kids out on the beach and say, let's look at stones. And, you know, then they might turn out to be great stonemasons later. You know, so. Well, you also have the Maori tradition uh, there. I mean, right in the southern in New Zealand. So they have oh, a yeah. deep relationship with the nature and, and the sea and and uh, creatures and things. So. There is that there too. I think that must inform. Yeah, there's the mythology, and there is a stone in um, where I'm working in New Zealand that is this, the region that I'm in. It's famous, called Punamo. It's a type of jadeite, and they carve um, all the sacred carving that the Maori does with the stone. It, it's exclusively they have domain over it um, th- from the government, so I can't technically go out and collect Punamu myself. It's not it's not my right. You have to be Maori to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so, um, but it's a very beautiful, special kind of, I mean, and I find jadeite in Puget Sound as well. There's some in the labyrinth. So it's, it came down from Canada. The glaciers brought it down. But um, in Canada, you know, in British Columbia, you can find big, huge boulders of jadeite on the coast. And it's a spectacular green um, kind of luminescent stone that has a special properties. It's carvable. and hmm. Uh, is there any, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, I have so many questions. Um, is there any tradition in the in the Inuit tribes or any of the st- uh, coastal tribes with the, using this material? Um, not really. I think they really worked more with um, with wood, with cedar, you know, uh, carving. Um, t- and then coast. all that rots away. So I don't know that, um, I think because of the lushness of the landscape, um, it's very hard to, for really old things to, maintain themselves i think like in uh in europe in northern europe you'll see you know like stonehenge type type things they did a lot of monolithic stonework that has lasted for thousands of years you know from late neolithic periods because because of the size of the material that they were working with mm-hmm. um in 
the Mediterranean, there's a lot of mosaic work done because it's a hot climate and actually pebble mosaic is a very good surface to make floors with because you can pour water on it and it will kind of air condition the space. So that was one of the functional reasons to do it. Um, like the stones you were talking about in Rhodes, um, yeah. they're, they're, it's the structure, ge geologic structure that you'll get repeat. You go down to the beach and there are millions of pebbles that are all the same shape and size because it's the way the wave action is tumbling them in the, in the crystalline structure of the stones. So you get this, so it lends itself to making patterns because you can go down there and scoop up, you know, buckets full of stones that are all very almost repetitive shapes. And then if you sort through those and find exactly, you can do these very exacting designs. So there are in Pella, which I went to in Northern Greece, north of Thessaloniki, there are mosaics that are um, 3,000 years old stone mosaics that are still intact. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and Crete too. Um, yeah, so let's get, let's get built. back to your gathering presentation. Um, the making of the Bainbridge Island Labyrinth Mosaic. And yep. you write in your blog, what inspires me the most is when art works in harmony with nature. So was there, uh, you, you, you told a little, expressed a little bit about this in terms of the stars. So this, was there a natural process to, uh, natural flow to the process for creating this labyrinth? And can you give uh, our listeners some examples? You know, yeah, how, the people, um, the cl your clients, how did they contact you? You know, sort of. How did that whole thing work? Yeah, I had done a project for um, my clients uh, at the Islandwood School where the gathering is going to be held. Um, it was a cistern um, that collects the water from the learning center. Um, the buildings um, collect their rainwater in these big um, concrete pipe tanks, but the tanks aren't very attractive. They're just big concrete pipes that were set vertically in concrete and then they fill up with water and then they have a spigot on them. So so she wanted me to mosaic the exterior of one of these and make it into a, a decorative art object using mosaic. And so I built basically, a, it told the geologic, the story of how the island was formed and the forces that made that created the geology of the region. So it was, it was basically just kind of a scientific thing abstracted in an artistic way to tell you just kind of a story of how of how the region was made and the glaciers and the rivers and faulting and volcanic activity. And so those are all represented in in the mosaics. And she liked, and then I taught the children about these forces and how everything was, how, how all this, this worked together in this decorative way so that they would have a visual understanding. They could go back to the cistern and go, oh, look, here's the glaciers here and here's where it melts and this river's flowing down the side here and creating a valley. And and um, so it's basically, you know, a visual representation of that. Um, when I got to the site, there was a big lawn there and a labyrinth that had been built by the landscape company that she was not happy with. It was a very simple, I think, three circuit labyrinth. and um, so I did, I just basically paced off the space to see, you know, with the way the trees that surround the space to kind of get a sense of how big I would make it that would fit gracefully in there without having to do a great deal of alteration, without having to remove any trees um, and to have minimal impact on the landscape that was there and set something within it that felt like it fit perfectly. And when I paced it off, it was exactly 36 feet, um, 12 paces uh, with a three foot pace with my long legs. And I uh, was like, that's a very auspicious number. So um, threes and sixes. And so, cause I'm interested in numerology and there's also a prayer wheel on the property and it has four panels that represent four different ecosystems in the region. And when you turn it, you turn it nine times. And so nine times four is 36. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, there's a direct relationship to that. So because a bell rings when you turn it nine times. Mm -hmm. And so that became intrinsically linked to, I wanted it to have a direct connection to the labyrinth. So, so I started to, and so what, the design basically comes out of what you can collect, you know, it's, you, you can't change the shapes of the stones and colors. You can only, you can only incorporate them. So, so I went down to the beach, which is called Rockaway beach. Um, it's right next to the property. 
And it's a very interesting beach because the property where the labyrinth is built was the largest lumber mill in the world for about 40 years and uh, the Blakely Lumber Company. And it became the largest shipbuilding yard in the world. So they built hundreds of ships in this little bay that is basically a forested little, you know, um, harbor. <clears throat> There's almost no remnant of any of the original of this once, you know, heavy industrial, you know, um, community that was there and but ships came from all over the world loaded with ballast they put stone in the ships to keep them upright they would arrive at Blakely Harbor and they would throw all the stones overboard and then load up with timber and haul it back to Australia to Chile to Germany to England so there's actually stone from from Japan um, you know that was all thrown offshore and it's washed up onto this beach yeah. it's about two miles long and it's it's a beach entirely covered with rock that has all this glaciated rock so there's probably 20 or 30 different kinds of minerals just from the natural deposits and then another 20 or 30 different kinds of stone that were brought in on these ships so i had this incredible selection of material to pick from you know, so many different kinds. It's one of the most amazing beaches I've ever collected on is right next to the site. So, so people have asked me, can you build this labyrinth somewhere else? And I'm like, no, I actually can't because I don't have access to this kind of, this is specific to this area. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that was remarkable about it was there was a lot of color. Um, I could find yellow rocks, orange rocks, pink rocks, purple rocks, brown, um, green, lots of shades of green, you know, wonderful green stones up there. So I started bringing, um, it took about two and a half months to prepare the site. They had to level it and do some filling and do a compacted base of gravel that was very highly engineered because it's a big flat mosaic and I was like I don't want this to ever settle and have you know, depressions forming and cracks it has to be perfect and last for hundreds of years and it so has the, a per so it was a foundation you had I mean it does yeah. get it does freeze does it freeze up there uh not really it does but oh. there's no frost heave so mm. so it would be yeah it would probably not be the ideal thing to build in an area where there's frost heave you'd have to do an amazing amount of infrastructure like three feet of concrete underneath or something you have to right. go below the frost line when you're yes. building on areas yeah. where you have frost heave. so it right. makes it much more technologically and the engineering is more complex and expensive yeah. so but basically they they did a beautiful job and prepared this perfectly flat site that had a 36 um, foot diameter steel ring that was I said I don't want it to stray half an inch you know at any point it has to be exactly at this point because I'm going to be making concentric circles and if there's a variation in the shape then it's going to get wonky as I <laughs> go in labyrinth that was it was a daunting process because I'd never built a labyrinth before and it has to be pretty you know you have 11 i built a Chartres cathedral style labyrinth because you have 11 circuits but you also have the center um which is the rose in the Chartres cathedral labyrinth so i just made it a circle and um, that was the 12th ring basically for me so you have three sets of 12 is this, this 36 diameter um the four panels it all it relates to the seasons mm -hmm. and the 12 months of the year the 12 moons that you'd full moons that you'd have during a year so i started to attach i I started to develop an attachment to lunar cycles to the cosmos to the galaxies to our solar system so I, and then because you turn at four, um, I oriented so that you enter from the east, which is what how you would enter most Hindu and Buddhist temples in Asia. Mm -hmm. They're all oriented to the east and a lot of Neolithic and um, uh, you know, you're orienting towards the rising sun. So I wanted the entrance to be like you're entering from the beginning, the beginning of the day. So it's so it's relating to the way the earth turns as it rotates around the sun. And and that relationship is direct and, and real. And then um, So you're you're entering in the east looking west. Yes, yeah, yes, exactly. So I had eight huge boulders placed around it on the cardinal points so that it would be like a compass surrounding the labyrinth and you could 
and and then you turn at the cardinal points so you're entering from the east and so when you're on the, so the the circuits that turn in the directly facing south and then west and and north and then that creates four quadrants within the labyrinth and those mm-hmm. become the four seasons mm-hmm. and so i did uh i made 12 moons on the exterior on the 11th circuit on the outside and those are oriented. So those, so each full moon of the year is represented in the outer ring. So you can actually do walks on the full moon. And when you hit that particular moon, then you can do some kind of ceremony or acknowledgement of that moon. And it gets, gets people that walk the labyrinth to start paying attention to the lunar cycle. So this, and, is, a, th- this is more of an expression of the Mayan calendar than the Gregorian. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. Mayan calendar. And then also, um, if you go, if you travel in, in like in Bali, they, every full moon, they spend days preparing for it because it's this sacred moment. It's very connected to agriculture. Um, um, in a lot of cultures, before we had calendars and paper and things that would tell us what day it was, they had to use, you know, watch shadows and clock. And basically priests were the ones who they built these temples and systems that in order to observe shadows so that they could tell what time of what part of the year it was and how the days are getting longer and when the equinox was is going to happen and when solstice has happened and and then you also look at the position of stars and and you're basically kind of creating a relationship with the cosmos based on the time of year that you're passing through. And so I wanted to incorporate all those concepts into the labyrinth because you're walking on a path. And I thought it would be much more interesting. Usually a labyrinth is just a pattern and you're walking on this pattern, but it doesn't, the, the path doesn't change. It's the same material all the way around. So you're walking in circles, but I wanted it to be you're walking through time and space and through the cosmos and through the seasons and and that you can recognize those by the colors of the stones that you're stepping on, the symbols and the mosaics that I'm creating and um, yeah, patterning and the and where I collected them from. So it becomes this kind of, you know, the, it becomes more and more layered and complex and fascinating so it just developed as a story so i started bringing all these rocks and i'd pile different colors in different areas and see what i could come up with and and um, i developed the ideas as i built it so it wasn't all clear in the beginning i had a sense of things that i might want to incorporate but it really evolved as i did it and so, so this is what you're talking about you're, in your blog. You talk about capturing the essence of what you're trying to allude to and creating something that captures a soul. And you write, it all relates to the way we flow through life. So this is a, an ancient way of being in the world that we've sort of lost, that the, yes, lack, exactly. that the labyrinth has brought us back to, uh, pre-Gregorian, pre uh, you know, that it's that we relate, you know, there's a time to sow and a time to reap, and it's all according to the lunar and solar cycles. Uh, the Mayans also incorporated the three closer planets. And so this is this is a an inner so is so this is your inner spiritual philosophy and philosophy informing your outer artistic expression is that not correct yeah yes uh huh yeah and really establishing a connection i mean i think one of the problems in society is we've lost this connection you know people don't have a direct relationship with nature they don't understand it it's an alien thing. It can be frightening. There's a lot of times people, I mean, that's one of the reasons people tolerate environmental degradation is that they don't have a relationship with nature, that they don't respect it. They don't understand it and they don't know it and they don't feel it. So it's, so it doesn't bother them. If, I mean, and a lot of times people will destroy nature as an act of control, you know, that, okay, I've eliminated this thing that was threatening to me because I never knew what it meant. And, um, you know, we're basically destroying this planet because of our consumptive lifestyles that do, that do not relate to sustainability and, and respect for the systems that sustain us. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that I really want. I want people to, to become aware, you know, I mean, you walk this barefoot because the mosaic has texture. And so you get reflexology people. It's so interesting. Once it was finished, it was a really long process and it wound up becoming this, 
very involved story and people would come visit all the time you know people were coming down to see what was going on and so i would develop a relationship with them and i would build something for them they would go to the prayer wheel and when you turn the prayer wheel the idea with the tibetan prayer wheel is you set an intention in your mind and then you turn it mm -hmm. and that intention goes out into the world and that's specifically written on a plaque that this is how you know to use this so i would tell people and they'd come down there's a prayer wheel over there and i want you to think about something that's going on in your life that's really relevant and important at this point and then go over and set an intention and do do something that you would like to see happen in your life or for somebody or just whatever comes to you that feels resonant and then i will make you i'm well because we've come here and had this conversation and you're doing that i'm going to make a little symbol in here for you so when you come back and walk the labyrinth later and you get to this spot you'll say oh here's my little flower my little you know thing that he made on that day and it'll make you think about that day and the thoughts that you were having and your intentions and what the weather was like and you know it, it, it'll cause it'll create some kind of distinct memory and and that became the intention that as i met people i was like we're going to create a moment in time that is encapsulated in this spot in the labyrinth and it's part of the evolution of how the story is unfolding as it's being built so when we had the dedication about 200 people came and they were all people that i had met as i was building and most of them had something that was personal integrated into the labyrinth itself so that they could all they could bring people and go oh, here's this you know this is what he built when we had this conversation and you know and so it, and and then a lot of intention was created um, some mythology was created on the spot just from we would talk about something and then I would kind of make up a story and and incorporate it into the design and it would become part of it would become a mythological aspect. Yeah. Sounds phenomenal. So but this is just to be clear, this is on private property. That beach mm -hmm. is a private beach on yeah, Cambridge it's Island. accessible to the public so you can walk on the beach and um and the park is open 24 hours a day to the public so even though it's privately owned um my clients pay for the maintenance of it and own the property but it is open to the public oh it is oh, okay yeah mm -hmm. um this is there i have lots of questions but we don't have a lot of time left so i'm gonna yeah. keep going. yeah, we, we okay. can easily gobble it all up just um <laughs> Yeah. Um, but so let's go on the south. You're on the South Island in New Zealand and uh -huh. now and you're doing a commission there currently. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, the, going to be, I'm going back um, the beginning of November for six months and I'll mm -hmm. be working on um, we're going to try and complete phase one of this project. Uh, my clients are. Uh, very environment they have an environmental organization they do a lot of funding and they built the Islandwood school so that children in the Seattle region can come and st um, have an intensive week of nature camp um, the classes are taught by environmental education graduate students and so they create these kind of um, institutions where they're teaching they want to teach children about nature so that they will have an impact on the environment and the world you know it's the way to change the world is to teach children to respect nature and then they'll incorporate that into their lifestyles and teach other people. And, and so in New Zealand, this project is a, um, it's meeting living building challenge standards, which are the highest environmental standards for construction in the world. So non-toxic materials, a lot of recycled materials, it's the largest solar power installation on the South Island. So it will generate a week's worth of um, electrical reserve for the community. Um, has all composting toilets. It treats all of its gray water and black water and um, collects all of its runoff into big underground reservoirs. And that's treated so that all the drinking water um, and toilet, you know, well, there aren't flush toilets, so, but, but all the water used on the site is going to be collected on the site. So. And so reused, has, reused, reused, yeah, uh -huh. yeah re recycled, 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 yes. 
Yeah. And so they're using all the latest technologies and bringing all these things in. So it's an educational thing. They, they're developing it so that you can give tours and take people around. And so here's the solar meter hut that shows how much electricity was generated by it. And they have maybe 10 different kinds of solar collective technologies going on and um, heat exchange and insulation and um, the way light gets into buildings so that you don't have to use as much electricity. So it's all about showcasing technologies and ideas and but it wasn't being done in a way that you could read it so i they they i was not originally involved in the project but they brought me in because they wanted it to become more of a story where you could you know if we were walking down the path it has the mosaics will actually kind of tell tell you things about the landscape of the region and about the um, systems that are happening there where the water is running into this pipe and going down you know I can do a mosaic that leads over to that runs like a stream and tells you where the tank is so you kind of get a sense of the infrastructure that's buried underground is um, is indicated with some of the the stonework that I'm doing and then it, it just gives it all meaning and purpose and uh to so that it's not just random decorative stuff it has more it has a that's i guess what my specialty is is to bring in as much meaning as possible so it's um to really scour the concepts for ideas and scour the landscape for ideas and develop a direct connection um the milky way is spectacular there so i'm building all these mandalas so it's basically i'm building kind of a milky way galaxy on the ground there. So at night, when you look at these starburst mosaics and look up at the sky, you'll feel like there's a direct connection. Yeah. So what I saw in the photographs on your blog was actually mandalic uh, paths, um, uh, stepping stones, as yeah. well mm -hmm. as in front of that one little shed, there was almost prayer rugs, four of them. That yeah, and they the different the four elements, yeah. The so. Four elements, right. And and so you're so people are actually stepping on these when they go into that that structure as well as when they go from one place to another. So mm -hmm. they're so they're looking at these and stepping on them as they're going through this this location. This yes, and um, the stones the the mandalas are mostly made. I, I wound up developing this just because I would go out and collect stone from a specific location. I'd go up the Dart River and collect from an area. And then and those stones are unique to that area. There will be a certain kinds that appear there that don't appear, say, on the lakeshore a mile away or something. So I wound up doing these kind of geologic samplers from specific locations. And when I went to the University of Otago in Dunedin, when I was doing a, a road trip, I went to the geology department because I wanted to see if I could find somebody who knew a lot about the geology of the specific region. And um, someone took me up to an office of this woman who had written a book about central Otago, this region, and on um, the geology. And I started showing her pictures of the mosaics of these stepping stones and, and told her that, you know, these are from specific areas where the stones were collected there, like these geologic samplers. And she was kind of blown away by it. She was like, nobody's ever done this before. And this is, and she would look at one and, well, these, the, you know, this is made of these specific kinds of geologic, you know, materials that were formed in a specific formation that happened because of certain geologic forces and you can see that and they said this is this kind of stone and this kind of stone and this kind of stone and that would only appear in a certain region depending on you know the forces that brought those stones to that area or where they were formed and so she contacted two people who had done the geologic survey in the 60s of the entire Wakatipu Lake Basin region and they immediately they were like geology geeks and they were like, oh, here's a guy who's working on, we've never seen this before. You know, usually you teach geology and people go into mining or something, you know, if you studied those things. And, and here's somebody who's actually interested in the material itself for its beauty mm. and, um, and showcasing it and arranging it in ways that kind of look like geologic form, formed, naturally formed things, their patterns. And so they came and they brought a, uh, 
a loop of magnifying glasses and we they identified every single mineral that I had and would be pointing, you know, this stone came from a vein in that, it's called this formation that occurs over there in the Humboldt Range on that side. And, and they brought me this beautiful geologic map of the area. And so they could actually tell me where the specific a pebble came from. Wow, how exciting. That must have been so exciting for that. them. Yeah, it was exciting for them. And it was really what, it was kind of like a fantasy for me. I mean, I've always wanted, I wanted to do it on Bainbridge Island, but there wasn't anybody that had the knowledge. So um, I was able to identify some of the stuff, but I didn't, I haven't yet had a geologist. It would be fun to bring a geologist to the labyrinth because they could say, oh, this is, you know, they would identify. I mean, I've incorrectly identified a lot of the minerals because I don't know them. Mm. as well as I should and so having somebody who knows all the scientific names of everything and the crystal and they can get a magnifying glass out and look at the crystal and structure and identify a specific mineral is fascinating to me you know so all right so I have one more question and then I think we have somebody else on the line here I think wants to ask ask a question so we got to get to that um you you worked with uh, uh, on the South Island when you were the you've done you've been to the South Island a number of times to in, in order to create what you're creating there, and you worked with a local artist Carolyn Robinson Caroline yes. Robinson yeah. who yes. visited the Halls Hills Labyrinth on Bainbridge Island and created yes. a Seventh uh-huh. Circuit Labyrinth on site for you in New Zealand to walk in Glenorchy is that how you pronounce it Yeah, Glenarchy Glenarchy it's a Scottish. And you write, my wish is to incorporate ceremony and frequent blessings into the development of the projects to keep them meaningful. Have you been able to honor this wish since then in a specific way or just through the mandalic uh, uh, artistry that you're creating there? Yeah, it's been kind of tricky because a lot of, I mean, there are about 40 people working on the project. It's a big project. So there, there's a big, there are all these construction crews working and generally they're just constructing. You know, there, there are only a couple of piece, people that have artistic training working on the project. So I have about five or six people that are helping me prepare sites and I wind up working seven days a week because I'm like, well, let me build the landing to that you know, cabin because you're just going to pour an exposed aggregate you know, driveway mm. or something. So let me build a threshold and then we can pour the driveway up to it. So I'm really kind of doing a lot of intervention and running to keep ahead. Oh, boy. Wow. The um, Caroline lives on the North Island up in Auckland. And so it's been kind of there, there's it's funny. There's a little bit of um, there's provincial attitudes. So um, <laughs> uh, I was called the crazy American for a certain amount of time. Um, then ironically, I found out that I had relatives that moved to the South Island in 1860s. So I, I have ancestry that precedes almost everybody in the area. Oh, that's great. That <laughs> is so great. then they're like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, oops. Yeah. And Caroline's from the North Island and they always kind of shunned her more than me because she's from the North Island. There's a rivalry. Uh, uh, so, um, oh, well. It's amazing. She did a project called The Basket of Dreams in Queenstown that if you Google it, it's incredible. She's done some really wonderful things, but um, I don't know that we'll be working together in the future or not. I'm not sure. So she has a lot of knowledge of Maori culture and um, a lot of ideas, but she's not there. I'm there all the time. And so I'm, I'm really engaged fully in this and it's, it's harder to bring people in on a, you know, just for have her show up for like four or five days and have a big amount of input when I'm, I'm, I'm always con- trying to convince her that I've actually thought these things out for <laughs> weeks in advance and, and instead of just like, oh, let's sit down and try and figure out what's going on. It's like I already have. So, <laughs> so um, but I, her work is amazing. So, and, and one of the things that we wound up doing, cause we were kind of not competing artists, but coming from different perspectives is that we would do these, I would call on her to do some kind of Maori ritual so that we could um, find ways to 
to connect and on a deeper level you know there's this thing where they press your foreheads together and you breathe so if we were having some kind of little sparring argument or something say like, okay let's press our foreheads together and breathe each other's breaths yeah. <laughs> and it would really it would really work with her because she was very intense you know and that would make her um <laughs> be like okay now we're we're we have this heartfelt connection again let's work from that instead of working from you know you're not doing it the way i would do it or well, this has been wonderful. I mean, I, I, I could go on for hours with you. I could ask millions of questions. I wish we had more time. Uh, Denny, are you there? Can you unmute yourself and come on? If you have some questions of Jeffrey, would you like to ask them now? Well, hi, Christiana and Jeffrey. How are you doing today? Hi, hey, this, great. This is Denny Dyke. He is the other featured speaker at the, la at the gathering this year. Go ahead, Denny. Uh, yeah, Jeffrey, it seems like your work takes a little longer to accomplish than mine. I normally finish in about two hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that. I mean, I think <laughs> that it's, like, it's sort of full spectrum this way. So I'm uh, working geologic time, although you're working, you know, sand is the most profound thing there is on the planet for me. Because you, if you look at that with a magnifying glass, it, they're like stones, but they're teeny, you know, and every single one is different. And you have trillions of them so it's uh yeah. yeah well i'm really looking forward to uh the gathering and meeting everybody with labyrinths and you and christiana i'm looking forward to talking to you next week okay do you have yeah. any, any yeah. other specific questions for jeffrey or well i will have a lot of time to speak up there because yeah. i've got a lot of questions <laughs> about uh, his type of work <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm the same way. It's like, uh, which one do I start with? But um, do you have one specific one that you want to add right now for this interview? Uh, exactly. How long was the project on Bainbridge Island? Um, it took about two and a half months to prepare the site. So I wound up just waiting until it was done. And then I came and um, I drew the design in the crushed gravel so i was able to draw the entire thing and get a sense of how it was laid out and how wide the paths could be in the gaps in between because it, it's a it's a it's smaller than the actual shards labyrinth but it doesn't have a big rose in the center it doesn't have the crenellated border on the outside so um, i was able to condense it a little bit um so the proportions are different but but they're really related to the specific you know um space i really wanted to play off that you know the concept of the 12 rings you know, 11 rings and then the center and the center is the sun it has a lot of stones from delos where apollo was born in greek mythology i went to delos with it with uh, with these archaeologists because i was there in the winter and got their blessing to collect materials and and um so there's a direct connection with Delos in the center of the labyrinth. And then the nine planets are the inner nine rings. And then there's a Tibetan mala with 108 stones in the 10th circuit. And that relates directly to the, uh, to the prayer wheel. So you can actually walk the 10th circuit and step on the 108 stones and do some kind of little prayer and do like a Tibetan circuit, like you were going walking around a, a stupa, a Buddhist temple or something. So. Mm -hmm. So, so it's incorporating all these different kinds of concepts and religions and beliefs into into this cosmological wheel, basically, that it's just so interesting. It was wonderful to be able to bring so many different kinds of ideas into it and just through intention, I guess. You know, I, I want to do this, so let's do it. And, and if you tell the story and make it kind of relevant to what's happening, then it's working in time and space and kind of manifesting a, a dream, basically. So, well, so I'm from, really looking forward to walking that path. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. Yeah, people cry sometimes. It's interesting. You sit and watch, and they'll be walking, and they'll just all of a sudden burst into tears, or they'll you know, come over here and look at this, you know, those recognize something special. And then if I'm there, I can go over and say, you know, actually, that's really interesting that you're drawn to that because it's, this was what happened when I built it. And, and they'll be like, wow, that's amazing. You know, cause it wind up being, they'll have an intuitive sense develops or, or just something attracts you because of the beauty of the materials or, 
or some little object that's in there and but it all is relevant there's something there's a reason that everything's there it's not just a decorative thing and i was just making it to make it pretty it it has a soul to it yeah it seems like all of those stones from all of those places i mean to use an unprofessional term it's got a lot of juju in it i mean a lot yeah, of juju yeah. so you know you can't we might be think we're disconnected, but the labyrinth itself as a design is meant to connect. It's meant to reconnect. It's meant to reawaken. That's what it's meant to do. And so, which is no accident that it's being used so much nowadays, my, my professional opinion. And yeah, so yeah. then you have that with connected with these rocks that have been in these places that have been used for ceremony and ritual for thousands of years. Delos, forget about it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Many centuries, thousands of years. So you've got all of that compacted into this one space that is also a sacred area. Bainbridge Island was a sacred area. It's a gathering place for the uh, First Nations tribes there, the indigenous yes. tribes. So there's a lot of amazing juju right there that, you know, that you, I would be surprised if people weren't, weren't profoundly affected by walking that, um, you know, with all of that going on there. Um, yeah. You have to be really kind of have a lot of, fodder in your brain to not actually yeah. <laughs> become engaged when you're walking. I mean, it's interesting to watch because different people, some people are in a hurry. I watch people, they'll have their running shoes on and they'll drive up and get out and kind of walk it as fast as they can and then run back to the car and, mm -hmm. and they may come there and do it every week or something and they do it. So, and then some people it takes them two hours to walk it and kids, mm -hmm. one of the most interesting things is the kids get really engaged. A lot of times it's hard. They'll be like, come on, we're going to go now. And like small children, will be just down on their hands and knees completely engrossed in the fact that there's so many little things little discoveries and things going on in there and there's a hole in the center of the labyrinth which is not traditional i left an opening and that's the 13th moon it represents the 13th moon if there's a blue moon in a year and um so you'd have two full moons in one month and then it also represents lunar and solar eclipses of the of the sun and the moon lining up with each other so so i wanted to represent that phenomenon and we just had an incredible you know solar eclipse in the pacific northwest in oregon this year and um so if you you can go and kind of honor those auspicious you know celestial moments they're actually re you can relate to them and clock them in the labyrinth there's a there's a way to to celebrate them a, di a direct relationship yeah the, well well the the chart labyrinth was originally designed with the lunations around the outside to count off the lunar cycles so right, right. That, that's inherent in that design. It's the, the, the design that's, that, that's unlike the classical labyrinths that you find other places. In that. Um, well, I, you know, gazillion questions, Danny, we can't, I can't wait to see you at the gathering and, uh, and, and chat some more. Um, Danny, thank you so much for coming on and, and saying hi and, and, and being a part of this uh, interview and this uh, question and answer period. We're out of time. Um, we could talk for another two hours, but unfortunately I've yeah. got to go and I'm sure you do too. But it, it, Jeffrey, it's been a pleasure sharing this hour with you and thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, likewise. And I look forward to meeting you, Denny, and talking to you about, yeah, everybody. It's going to be so interesting to meet all the labyrinth aficionados and see what their experiences are and, and learn more about. Yeah, I, 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 you will have a lot of people glommed onto you for the whole, the whole entire time that you're there after your, your, feature your keynote at your address because people are are will be absolutely fascinated by this i mean people who walk labyrinths a lot will just completely get it and understand and and it'll i think it will make a huge difference and thank you so much for 
for being a part of, of this. And thank you, Lisa and Stephen, for contacting you and 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 having you uh, be be the feature speaker, getting you to be this one of the feature speakers. It's wonderful. So many continued blessings on your path, and and have a wonderful time uh, for the next six months in in New Zealand. Lucky dog, lucky. How wonderful is that? It's a, an extraordinary place. I have been there. It's I would go back there again in a heartbeat. Yeah, it's going to be great. And okay. people should read the blog because the, um, the blog that I wrote, I mean, it's kind of hard to navigate because I think there's 12 of them or 13 of them total, but they're very in-depth stories about with pictures of the people that I would meet and the, what I built for them and the story. So, so there's kind of like a diary of the entire creation of the thing in great detail. It takes a few hours to read them all and um, a lot of history and yeah, so it, it it's so that people can have a, a really intimate sense of what what it really is when you walk it. You can actually learn that from just reading the blog. So it's available on the internet to all that information. And what's the blog? Can you give us the name again? Um, JeffreyGardens.blogspot.com. But if you Google my name, Jeffrey Bale and Labyrinth, then, um, then links to the blogs will come up. Okay. And um, and that'll, each circuit is featured in a blog. So when I would build, say, the Jupiter circuit, you know, which is the, I think the, the, the seventh, or you know, the Neptune is the ninth, and the Pluto or the Pluto circuits the ninth, and the Neptune circuits the eighth. And so they, so those are planetary and have identifications. I talk about mythology and the and actual the actual physical aspects of the, the planets themselves. Um, Right. It's just like a, it's a it's an opportunity to learn and expand our knowledge of the universe and and feel more aware. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, yes. Can't yeah, wait to see, to yeah, can't wait to see you in a in a couple of weeks. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, you are very welcome. Take good care. You too. You've been listening to the Labyrinth Society's Many Paths, Many Visions broadcast by Spreaker with your host, Christiana Britton. Be sure to check the Labyrinth Society website, our Facebook page, and global group for a list of upcoming dates and guests. Also, if this podcast has piqued your interest in the Labyrinth Society and you'd like more information about membership, please go to www.labyrinthsociety.org forward slash membership. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and may you find what you need on your path through life. Namaste.